You say amen? amen. You may be seated. Pastor Lucas, there couldn't be a more appropriate hymn and new song um, for this sermon as we come to uh, God's gracious restoration. He is a gracious king with a gracious restoration. I want to encourage you, if you don't have a sermon outline, these men are here to give you one. And uh, so lift your hand and they will hand one to you. Um, John, there's some this up further closer up here. There you go. Great to have you here this morning. As we come to the Word of God, we study the Word of God carefully. And I want to just commend you, Sheridan Hills. You have made it through 14, well, 13 messages um, from the book of Hosea. God's Word is worth our study. And the book of Hosea is worth our study. If you look online for messages, you will find that about 99% of the time, there is one or two sermons given to the book of Hosea by any given church. For many, many churches, no sermons given to the book of Hosea. And we have been looking and seeing over these last 13 Sundays and now the 14th as we come to this, a glorious message that has enriched our faith and helped us see who God is and to deal honestly with who we are and who we are not. And so this morning we come again and finally to the last chapter of Hosea. It's Hosea chapter 14. This is the end of the book. And we've had 13 chapters where there's been a, quite a bit of a judgment, a, quite a bit of a revealing of, sin, of Israel's sin, that this has been the nation of Israel running from God, not honoring God, and God revealing His holiness to them in saying that you are out of step with me. You have transgressed me, and yet I in my graciousness will come and work and restore my people to myself. And that's what the, the book of Hosea is about, Hosea chapter 14, we see that salvation is from God. Well, let's review for deep impact here, um, and this is really more than verses 1 through 3. On the right-hand side of your outline there, notice here, letter A is, the prophet Hosea's message is that uh, Israel has been grossly unfaithful to God. Fill that in. Been, they've been grossly unfaithful to God. They have broken the covenant with God in every imaginable way. Now, if I were to ask you to help me out, I could say, how did they break the covenant with God? Well, there was a few ways in which they did this. Number one, they left the Word of God. Number two, they left worship of God. We see that rebuked early on. We see that they ran out after other idols and other gods. The, the nations and the cultures around them became more important than God. They looked for security in their own earthly lives instead of looking to the one who made all things. So they broke their covenant with God, and God is pointing that out through the prophet of, Isaiah, of Hosea in chapters 1 through 13. Look at letter B. God is rightly sending them into unavoidable judgment. So he's rightly sending them to unavoidable judgment. But this result, but this will result in his righteousness being revered. That's the first thing. It will result with them seeing that God is the holy God that they once knew. And so, his righteousness is going to be revered or respected, but look at the next part there in letter B, and his grace is being revealed. You see, when, when people just take a cursory look, to, they take a quick look at the book of Hosea, they kind of flip through it a little bit, and they think, man, there's a lot of judgment there. It's not very encouraging. Boy, I'd like to head over to John or 1 John, or I'd like to head over to Philippians or something like that. I mean, this, is, this seems a little thick. Well, let me, let me tell you that if you don't have a healthy understanding of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man, sinfulness of our own hearts, we will not have a healthy understanding of grace. And when we properly see the holiness of God and the need of man, and then we see what God, listen, what God has done to save us, bridging the gap between his purity and our great evil, 
we start to see the amazing grace that John Newton would write about. This is amazing grace. How sweet the sound that what? Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. This picture of his amazing grace that would come to us. Look at letter C. Chapter 14 is all about future grace. Chapter 14 is all about future grace. It's important for us to recognize what I've put in the parentheses underneath letter C. It says, Israel was still in their sin and headed for judgment when Hosea is declaring God's grace that is going to come. They, they are still in their sin. They haven't turned to God. Notice this. There's the, in verses 1 through 3, there's the call to repentance, confession, and faith. We've studied that over the last couple of weeks. And in verse 4, we see the promise of God's healing and His love. So let's look at those real quick. Look at verses 1, 2, and 3. It says, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. So after 13 chapters of judgment, here's the call. Return to the Lord your God. For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. You remember we circled stumbled at the top and we circled stumbled at the bottom. It's a nice bookend to this last chapter that when we are in sin, we stumble and we stumble badly. But we have a saving God that will save us out of our stumbling. Look at verse 2. Take words with you. You remember words matter to God. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, and here's the prescribed prayer, take away all iniquity. So that's the problem. We need to be forgiven. Take away all iniquity. Accept what is good. We will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. We're going to put our our action into our repentance. We're not just going to say, oh, forgive me, and then go on, keep doing it. He's saying, no, we're going to turn, and it's going to be a costly turning to God. We are going to put our money where our mouth is, put our action where our confession is. Look at verse 3. Here's the statement of faith. Assyria shall not save us. We're not going to turn to Assyria anymore for help. We will not ride on horses. We're not going to depend upon weapons of war. Middle of verse 3. And we will say no more our God to the work of our hands. No more idols. We're putting that away. In you the orphan finds mercy. And so they're recognizing properly who God is and what God does and the fact that he is a merciful, gracious God for the helpless. So they're recognizing their helplessness. You see, this is, this is part of the power of Hosea. The whole prophecy is showing us we can't save ourselves, but God is gracious to save He's gracious even after we've, we've proven our wicked and evil hearts that keep running away. He is gracious to save. And here it is in verse 4. This is what we studied last week. I will heal their apostasy or their backsliding. We studied those five words individually. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them. What does it say there? Freely. You see, this is what true love is. This is what true grace is. Now, I mean, we just sang it. To the king who has everything, I come before him empty-handed, and it's okay because he is a gracious God. You see, it's, he loves us freely. I will love them freely. And then here this morning, we're going to look at this idea of, for my anger has turned from them. Very, very key phrase. The word for is showing us how does, his, how does he heal our apostasy and why would he love them freely is because his anger has turned from them. And so I want us to look and see letter D here. In letter D over there on the right, you see, in Hosea we see God's faithfulness to his covenant with Israel. We see God's faithfulness to his covenant with Israel, but we also see, this is very important for New Testament Christians to see, we also see God's foundation for the new covenant, capital N, capital C. We're we're making a, a big deal of the fact that there is a new covenant that is promised, and this new covenant 
is going to be the fulfillment of the old covenant and, and bringing it into a full fruition, bringing it into the full promise that God is going to fully restore his people ultimately. And it's going beyond what Hosea could see. It's going beyond what Israel could see. They couldn't see eventually where all this is pointing to. They just knew that God was calling them to live for him, that they were being called to honor him. But I want us to see this. And on the back side of your page, I want you to see where this new covenant over in Jeremiah, and remember with me that Jeremiah is nearly a contemporary of Hosea at the same time but to a different group. Notice here with me, he's preaching to Judah, and we see, and right out there to the side at the top of the page, new covenant promised, okay? You're going to see this in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Very important text. Very important text for you to understand the gospel. Look at verse 31. Behold, Jeremiah writes, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make, underline it, a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Verse 32, not like the covenant that I had made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, that I was their husband, though I was their husband. So here God is saying, I am the one that is your husband. I am the one that is related to you. You are my bride, and yet you have broken this. And that's, that's what we see in Hosea, chapters 1, 2, and 3, with Hosea and his wife Gomer. It's the, an illustration of this very idea that now we're seeing in, in Jeremiah. Look at the next part. So the Lord says, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Verse 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after, after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, no, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, for the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So this is ultimately, uh, this is ultimately picturing and forecasting the fact that there is a new covenant that is going to be the true salvation of God revealed in the Messiah and for all time his people truly forgiven in every way. It will all be realized in Christ. So we also notice that this new covenant is exactly what Jesus was talking about the night before he would be executed. Look with me on your outline right there, Luke chapter 22 in verse 20. Notice that Jesus takes the bread, and it says, and this is, this is during the Lord's Supper, verse 19, and he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, verse 20. And likewise, the cup, he, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is, what does it say? circle those two words, is the new covenant in my blood. And so Jesus is showing that he is the inauguration of the new covenant through his death, that he is going to come and do what no man could ever do, no woman could ever do. He is going to perfectly fulfill the law of God, taking the wrath of God upon himself so that those who come and trust in him can follow in purity and holiness and strength and all that God has designed, the renewal that God can give. Now, over in Hebrews, a little bit later, a few decades later, we see the letter written to the Hebrews as part of the New Testament. And it does a very interesting thing. This New Testament letter called Hebrews quotes Jeremiah 31, which we just read at the top. Look what it says in in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. But as it is, 
Christ has obtained a a ministry that that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And he goes on in what we just saw at the top of the page. So this new covenant is the better covenant. It's the fulfilled covenant of God in Christ Jesus. The law being fulfilled, the the sin guiltiness of mankind coming to God in faith, looking to the Messiah, is being fulfilled. This means, listen, this means that salvation is only of God. It's never of anyone else or anything else. That we can never, and Hosea is painstakingly showing us that through God's interaction with the nation of Israel. God is showing us that through the fact that Israel can never live up to the fulfillment of the law. Instead, we need God's great grace and help. Look at the bottom there, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15. Therefore he, that is Jesus, is the mediator of what? A new covenant. So that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. And so when Jesus comes and he dies on the cross 2,000 years ago at what would become the end of the Old Testament, bringing in the New Testament with the new covenant, we see that the price has been paid. The Old Testament believers were looking forward to the coming Messiah. We have the privilege to do this. We look back to the cross and see that he did it. And number two, we look forward to his return, and we can't wait until all things are finally finished. We cannot wait for the restoration to be complete. We have the already, but the not yet. We've already seen that the price has been paid. We already seen that the payment has been paid in full, but we are still in this moment, in this era of time, when we are waiting for the consummation for the great marriage supper of the Lamb, the great uniting of God with his people, and then all things entering into the final state of being restored and renewed as God had intended from the beginning. And so this is the picture of what we see. And Hosea helps us to understand the New Testament picture that much more. So I want you to notice here in verse 4, flip your sheet back over and look what it says. Verse 4 says, I will heal their apostasy or their backsliding. I will love them freely for my anger has turned from them. Now this is glorious. God's anger and his wrath is turned away. Can you say with one loud voice, praise God? One, two, okay, let's do it again. One, two, three. Praise God that he is a gracious God who his anger is turned away. Because if his anger and his wrath is not turned away, you know, that's part of the great picture of salvation in Christ. We need to study how is his anger turned away. There's only one way in which we see his anger. It's not just because he's a whimsical God that has anger. He has fits of anger. You know, I'm going to wipe out these men. I'm going to wipe out these men. If you, a cursory look at the New Testament, you could think that God is an impulsive God like that. But we have instead a whole account of how God is purposefully working out his salvation plan for his people, not just dealing with the nation of Israel, but also projecting forward and giving hints of what he does in order to save his true people. And we see this in Romans chapter 8 in verses 8 and 9. 
And, um, you know, in verse 8 it says, but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9 explains that more. Look what it says in verse 9. It says, since therefore, we have, this is right on your front side of your outline, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more, <laughs> much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. You see, Jesus comes and he takes the wrath of God upon himself so that we can be forgiven, so that we can experience not the wrath of God, but the grace of God. This is all about God's grace. And so here we see, back in Hosea, that his anger is turned away from them. We we have a fuller understanding of what that means through New Testament. We have a fuller understanding of what that means through the new covenant, that God would come and bring his salvation. And notice what happens when we experience his salvation. Jesus also deals with this. And notice on the screen in front of you, this is another key picture. Jesus is speaking in John chapter 3 and verse 36. And notice what it says on the screen in front of you. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Wow. Look at the last part. But the wrath of God remains on him. You see, this is what it means to be unforgiven before a holy God. This is what it means for Christ's blood not to be applied to your account. This is what it means to, if you are not in Christ, if you're not a believer in Christ, and and we see over and over again that Jesus is saying, if you believe me and you believe in me, you're going to do what I say. You're going to obey me. You're going to walk with me. So that's, that's part of the picture that we see there is that whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. And so, but the wrath of God remains upon him. You see, the greatest escape of all time is not Steve McQueen out of a Nazi prison. The greatest escape of all time is our escape from sin and death when Jesus comes and pays our price for us. Notice 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10 on on the screen in front of you. Look what it says in verse 10. In this is love. You want to know what love is? In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What does the word propitiation mean except to be the beautiful atonement, the beautiful forgiveness, the beautiful payment that is made for our sins? And only Christ could do this. And so we see that this is what brings and turns God's wrath away from us in that Christ has died for our sins and all who are found in Christ do not experience the wrath of God but the grace of God. Now look at verses 5 through 7 back on the front side of your sheet and notice this on the front side of your sheet. Look what he says. And this is all about God's restoration. You can fill that in. This is the beautiful, this is part of the beautiful promises of Hosea after seeing all of their sinfulness, even before they've turned back to the Lord, God is saying, I'm going to turn you back to me. I'm going to heal your backsliding and look what all I'm going to do. And here we see it in verse five. And I've underlined all of the agricultural terms. This is given, God's blessing is often seen in a, agricultural terms that, that, you know, in that day and time, you know, we, we don't think much about drought. We don't think much about pests. We don't think about all that very much. Either the people in California that are growing our fruits and nuts or the people that are growing our vegetables in Homestead or in South America or wherever it is, we, in this day and time, being city dwellers, we don't think about the agricultural aspect very much. We just yell at Publix a little louder if they don't have exactly what we want. Where's Billy? Billy Billy's in charge of Publix. So, um, you know, we, we just look at, you know, hey, you know, what, what's the problem here? We don't realize how agrarian 
um, most of the rest of the world is in, in seeing this. But if you don't have the blessings of God upon the land, if you don't have the, that, that, that's a part of how we see God's great picture of blessing. Look at what it says in verse 5. I will be like the dew to Israel. You have to have moisture to have crops. If you do not have moisture, you do not have crops. Everything dries up and dies. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. His, root, his shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive and his fragrance like Lebanon. Three times Lebanon is mentioned here. They shall return and dwell beneath my shadow. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Where do you get wine? From grapes, from the vine. And so this is all a picture that God is saying, you cannot imagine the blessings that I will rain down on my people. And we see this in his restoration. Now, a couple of years ago, we did a, a very in-depth worldview study. And you remember that we said there are four words that capture the whole message of the Bible. And maybe you've never heard this before, but if you want to know what the Bible is all about, it's all about these four key words, and they're in the little gray box on your outline there. Let's say them out loud. This is the progression of the story of the Bible. Let's say them out loud. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration, or glory. That's the idea of heaven it being restored back. Now, I want you to notice this. We see in Genesis 1 and 2 God's glorious creation. We see in Genesis 3, right away, the fall from God's um, innocence, from our innocence, um, into our evil hearts, the fall of all creation, and everything is affected by that. And then if you just continue reading the Bible, you will find that the rest of the Bible is talking about, beginning in Genesis chapter 3, the redemption of God. It's even found in 1 and 2. But we see that the redemption of God is God's plan to show us his grace and to buy us back out of our rebellion in order to show his character of love and grace. And then eventually, that far one there, the restoration is going to occur. And the restoration is going to put things back the way they were before the fall. I cannot wait. My shoulder reminds me right now how much I cannot wait for the restoration. Some of you have things in your life right now that are reminding you how much you cannot wait for these earthly trials and hurts and hardships and griefs and sorrows that you are waiting by faith on that which is promised from God. And that eventually, he's going to make it all right. We said to Starting Point Group this morning, one of the great tasks of Sheridan Hills is to help church members make it faithfully to death. <laughs> Go, oh, yeah, we, we want to help you die well. We want to help you live well. We want to help you die well. And that's, we, we shouldn't be afraid of that. We shouldn't be bashful to talk like that. Death is a reality. And if you are going into death without Christ, you have no idea what death is actually coming. But when you are in Christ, Jesus said, he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Amen. And the life that we come to live makes this look like living in a garbage can. Yeah. I mean, what is to come is gloriously promised. And we see that, even a hint of that in Hosea, where we see that even while they're still struggling in their sin, when their hearts haven't yet turned back, God is making these promises. He's making these promises that are gracious restoration promises. And he's saying, I'm going to make it all okay. And your salvation is going to be only able to be blamed upon me. And so, friends... That is the test of the gospel, is do you look to Christ or do you look to something else? The true gospel is not in your moralistic, therapeutic deism. 
It's not in you, quote unquote, being a good person or you giving your tithe or you helping the people across the street or you down in your heart being a good person. Because the Bible tells, says to us that our heart is desperately sick. The Bible tells us that even the very best that we have to offer are as filthy rags before God. TJ, you said that very well yesterday in your speech. TJ just explained that you, you, people, many, many people think that it's by my good works that God is going to accept me. But we look at the prophet of Isaiah and he says, our best that we have to offer are as filthy rags, or the rags of leprosy or menstruation. They, they are filthy rags before God, the very best that you have to offer. And so we see that God is saying, salvation is through me and through me alone, and I will restore you. I will do what you cannot imagine. I want us to take just a minute and look at five, six, and seven real quick and see a few of these things. And there's a few different ways that you could say this, but I want you to get a, a little bit of a taste, a little bit of a, a joy in thinking about God's restoration of how glorious and how good it is. I want to put it in some terms that we can sink our teeth into. So it says in verse 5, I will be like the dew. My friends, this is the living water that Jesus spoke of. This is the living water that Jesus would look at the woman by the well, the Samaritan woman, and say, uh, are you thirsty? Yes. Why else would I come? Well, I, I can give you water that you'll never thirst again. And she asks him, who is this living water? What is this living water? And so we, we see Jesus as the living water, the water that brings life, the dew to Israel. Notice the next part. We see this in verse 5. It says, he shall blossom like the lily. This is a picture of beauty. This is, this is not about something that's going to be eaten so much as this is about just the glorious beauty of God's restoration. What we start to see here is that he's describing Lebanon, this fertile area of Lebanon. And it's kind of like going into, if you were to be a, uh, I guess, a Lord of the Rings fanatic, you would say, this is the Shire. You just come in and everything's green and flowing with all of this bounty. And it's beautiful. And it's, and it's just, it's luxuriant in its vegetation and in its productivity. And it's just a beautiful thing. And so we see here that, that this is the beauty of God's restoration. And not only that, but notice the next line, he shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. This is a part of the world where there's typically not large trees, where there's not huge steadfast oaks or not huge steadfast cypress. But here it's saying that yes, indeed, and these are steadfast and deep roots. When God restores you and when God comes and cares for the, the broken heart, he is doing so with a steadfast, deep-rooted strength. And then there's the next line that is there in verse 6. It says, he shoot, his shoots shall spread out. Here's the idea. There's new shoots of growth going up. And what are those new shoots of growth going to do? They're going to produce more fruit. They're going to produce more that is here. And so it is bountiful. His grace is bountiful. His restoration is abundant. Look at the next line that is there in verse 6. His beauty shall be like the olive. Now, what's interesting about the olive is, man, in the Middle East, you can't imagine how important olives are and olive trees are. And they do all kinds of things with olive trees. They, they use the fruit of the olive. They use the oil of the olive. It's part of food and nurture. It's part of of the health aspect. There are, there are things that are brought out of olives that brings healing to the body. So, and then there's even, it's a fuel, it brings light. Olive oil, when, when properly prepared, burns. And so we're talking about nutrition, we're talking about the taste of life, we're talking about light. So notice this here with me. The beauty shall be like the olive. Olives are really, really important in this mindset in this restoration. So this is the picture of it being rich and useful when God restores us. Notice the next part that is here, and you see it in the end of verse 6, and his fragrance like Lebanon. So here is this beautiful part is it's pleasant. It's pleasing. It, it doesn't just look good. It's not just aesthetically beauty, beautiful, but it's, it's aromatic, 
um, in such a way that is so sweet in goodness. You, I, I want you to see this morning that God's restoration is complete and beautiful and rich. And here's all these verses that are dedicated to showing us how good God's heart is toward us, even while we are still in our sin. Now, I want you to see verse 8 with me. Look what it says in verse 8. O oh, Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Now, verse 8 is interesting. You may want to make a side note here. It's one last swipe at the whole idolatry thing. Um, Hosea, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is taking one last swipe at their idolatry. It's as if to say, Let's water in the thought that your idolatry is completely wrong, offensive to God, and it's really stupid. It's stupid in light of eternity. Moms and dads, it's okay to explain to your kid that occasionally stupid is appropriate to use. And if it's ever appropriate to use, it's useful here when we talk about loving other things more than God, worshiping other things instead of God. This is simply foolishness, and that's what we see in this. So, in verse 8, we see the statement is this, this is your true God, not a dumb idol. Dumb is also okay to use. Dumb meaning mute, not able to speak, and not only unintelligent in the the common vernacular, but the picture is here, these idols can't do anything. They can't speak, they can't help, they can't do anything. Why would you turn to this and worship these things? Here we see at the end of the whole letter of Hosea, or the whole prophecy of, of Hosea, verse 8, where he is saying, I am the God that answers you. I am the God that looks after you. How beautiful it is to remember this. And then again we see this picture of who God is. Look what he says in verse 8. The poetry says this. I am like, and what is, it, what is underlined there? I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. I want us to see this idea. This is, this is so, so beautiful. When I, when I study this and I think about Revelation chapter 22... Here we see God is saying, look to to Israel. He's saying, look, Ephraim, I am like an evergreen cypress. I'm like this tree that never withers. I'm like this tree that doesn't dry up and lose all of its leaves and eventually dies. I'm not temporary. I am the perennial, green, productive thing that you need. And then look over with me. And, and, and in fact, look at the screen, not on the page, but look at the screen of Revelation 22. Now, help me think about this. Where is the book of Revelation in the Bible? Right. It's at the end of the Bible. How many chapters are in the book of Revelation? 22. So, we're at the end of the end, okay? So, if you want to look at the end of the Bible, here's the kind of thing that you're going to see. And it is this beautiful vision of the final state of things and what God has promised. And if you need encouragement, I want to encourage you very often to go and remember what we call eschatology or the the pronouncement of end things. Go and read the end of the book and you can be so encouraged. But notice what it says in verse 1, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. There it is again, water of life, the dew. Bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city also. Also on either side of the river, wow, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The picture is is that this tree of life is there in the middle of everything, and it's representing God's good restoration. It is representing God's good richness in his blessings, yielding its fruit each month. 
The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. What did we see last week? I will heal their backsliding. Here's the idea. Men and women from every tribe and every tongue and every nation will be there on that day worshiping God. This is a promise that God has made. So he's going to heal people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Verse 3, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. This is a glorious picture of God's gracious restoration. This is where the whole thing is leading. And the book of Hosea is pointing to this ever so beautifully, ever so subtly. We, we see, yes, it is applying to the nation of Israel in their circumstance, but we also see all of these hints that are just undeniable for the true restoration that Jeremiah is talking about, the new covenant and the ultimate blessing and the ultimate restoration that when God comes and saves you and restores you and sets you up for eternity, it is beyond our wildest imagination. Friends, we, we need to just recognize that Hosea is showing us one more time, over and over again, that man cannot save himself, only God can save. Man cannot forgive his own sin or anyone else's sin before a holy God. Only God can do that, and he does it through his great love and grace. And Hosea is making that so very clear. From Hosea and Gomer and their children all the way through the pronouncements of judgment, through the promises of his grace to come. Christians have to hold on to these promises. Christians have to look at them and say, oh Lord, you are so good that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You are so good that even today, in my sin today, and in my struggle, if there's any hope for any victory in me, it's all in you. And so we continue to cast ourselves upon him. Finally, I want you to see, as we mentioned briefly last week, look at verse 9. And it's the end. It's wisdom literature. It's saying, what are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with all of the prophecy of Hosea? And I want you to see this in verse 9. It says, whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord, or the ways of Yahweh, are right, and the upright walk in them. But transgressors stumble in them. Now, I think that verse 9, it's appropriate to say, this is for your life. Hosea is for your life. The message of Hosea can be applied in your life. Look what it's saying there. Whoever is wise. This is referring to anybody after 3,040 years ago. This was written about 3,040 years ago. For the last 3,040 years, people have had access to Hosea, and it's saying, hey, if you got ears to hear, listen and believe and see the way God works. And I say to you, in this day and time, if you have ears to hear, listen to this. Look to Christ. Run to Christ. Run to him as our only hope. This is for your life. Look what it says, like all of God's words, Hosea's prophecy is for God's true children right here and right now. So why would we ignore this? Well, we haven't, but may we de look deeply in the months to come and in the years to come, and between now and when you see the Lord face to face, I pray that you will love the truth of God's grace that comes ahead of all that we could ever do that leads us to repentance. Notice this, the wise versus the foolish, the godly versus the ungodly, the obedient versus the disobedient. Here we see part of the picture of God calling us to be a people who cast ourselves upon him in every way. And we have to ask ourselves, what is our response to the call of Hosea? Hosea is saying, come to God. 
Hosea is saying, run to God. And I want to invite you to run to God. What you will find, and what we always find in the Scripture, is that anyone who will run to God will be received by God. Run to Him from your sin. Run to Him in belief. Cast your belief upon Him. Cast your hope upon Him. Say, God, I am a sinner, but this tells me that you're a Savior and that you love me, and that you love me with an everlasting love. And if that's true, Lord God, I come. We come and we turn to Him in belief. And when we believe upon Him, He saves. It's not with anything that we bring in our hand. It's not with anything that we recite religiously in prayer. It's not with anything that we give. It's not in the holy way that we dress. It's not in anything except finding our hope in Christ. Notice this with me at the bottom and fill this in. What is your response to the call of Hosea? I call you to repent, worship, and walk in the ways of the Lord. That's what verse 9 is talking about. Or are you going to simply stare and stumble? I want to call you today to repent, believe, and run to God. Don't stare and stumble. Would you stand with me for prayer?